Any questions for which I don't have the answers? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to ask about your prehistoric open source kind of ideas and how, how it's always been with us. Can you explain how a spear is open source in the same framework that a fridge from General Electric that isn't really open source, but I mean, I, is? Did you ever watch uh, Connections? It was, an, it was an old TV series called Connections. No. Love that thing. It was a great idea. You should check it out sometime. Look for episodes on the internet. But okay. yeah, it's on YouTube. You can find cool. all the old episodes on YouTube. But yeah, I mean, it's how is it open source? Well, it's open source in the idea that when the first person figured out that he could smack somebody with a stick, somebody was watching. Ideas are open. Somebody sees, oh, oh, so if I just whack that thing with a stick, it's not going to eat me and I get to eat it, you know? And then at some point, somebody found out that if the stick was really, really sharp, you know, then you could stab something with it, you know, and that information was open. So the information was open from the beginning. It was open from the beginning just by virtue of the fact that you can see it. You can see it. You have an answer to the fridge question Okay. Under the patent laws that existed, you should be able to hear me. I can hear you. Okay. Under the existing patent laws, once something goes into the public domain, you have a right to use it, and it doesn't matter who created it. So a fridge from G, uh, GE that is uh, in the public domain since the 1950s, you have legal right to build one of those. Okay? Now, you don't have legal rights to build stuff that's still under patent. And this is why a lar large number of corporations are trying to extend their patents indefinitely. Yes, but this is where the whole thing falls apart as well, as far as patents are concerned. Okay, remember, the tur you know, it's turtles all the way down, um, or it's you know, it's dwarves all the way down. The, I mean, you're making quite a leap from a spear to a refrigerator here, okay? But somewhere along the way, somebody figured out that if you kept something in a cool place, it didn't, it didn't spoil as quickly. And then it was just like logical progressions. Okay, how do I keep something in a cool place for a longer period of time? And then on and on and on, the ideas flow from one to the other until you get to the point that, you know, if you compress certain gases and so forth, and the motion of the atoms starts to slow down, you know, heat is moved to outside of the system, and things inside the system start to cool down. It sounds like a hell of a leap from a spear, and it is, but we're talking like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. And one of the things that's happened with a large population of people in the world is, is the fact that all these ideas are being shared among all these people. The problem that I have with patents of almost any kind, I mean, I make the arguments against software patents because, frankly, it's an easy target, okay? There is no piece of code in existence that doesn't owe its existence to something that came before. It, there isn't any, okay? Um, Carl Sagan, there's a quote attributed to Carl Sagan. He said, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, first you have to create the universe, okay? And, and it's like that with every piece of software that's been written out there, okay? If you wanted to make it from scratch, well, you're going to have to invent computers. You're going to have to invent the languages. But you're, you're going to have to invent the technology that allows you to store information you know, in a system and, and, and then create programs that can run in that system. You're going to have to define and create your own version of computing technology, which is insane, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Especially since, you know, we're doing okay uh, so far, as far as computers are concerned. But, but yeah, it's a huge leap, but... Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not so much a question, but an example from, from actually from the 18th century. James Watt is often credited with inventing the steam, steam engine. He didn't. What he invented was the condenser that reduced the fuel consumption to a reasonable level. But at the time, steam engines all had what they would call the walking beam system, that they just went up and down. Somebody else, so he patented his condenser and started selling the machine. Somebody else invented the crankshaft at around the same time, which converted linear motion to rotary motion. Yep. Eventually, at the end of their patent periods, I think it was 17 years at the time, the, the two became open and people started making steam engines, movable steam engines. And Watt and his partner made more money after the patents had expired because they were the experts mm -hmm. in steam engines than they had during 
during the period when they had the exclusive uh, rights to the patent. Yeah, I, yeah, it makes perfect sense to me. You're Evan, right? <laughs> we don't know each other. <laughs> Quick question about my one concern about the future you've painted, and it's where free stuff goes to die. And by that, I sort of mean black holes, where free information goes into places where the rest of the world isn't able to benefit from it. And I'll give you two examples. So you used one of the 23 and Me and so on. Yeah. So there's examples in the States of people sending in their DNA samples, and it's found congenital health problems that have then been used by their insurance companies against them. Yeah. So when the data is misused in a way they didn't anticipate at all, right? You say, I give it to 23andMe, do whatever you want with it. Okay. It goes to your healthcare provider in Canada. Thankfully, we don't have that problem, but in certain places, an insurer might use that against you. Yes. And so uh, you also have an issue with Google's doing all these great things, but once information goes into Google, you don't know what they're doing with it. You don't have access to the stuff as they've analyzed it. They basically have access to it and you don't know their algorithms. You don't know what they're doing to it. And it's sort of like things go into some of these entities like Google and Amazon and Facebook or whatever. You don't know what they're doing with them. You don't know if it's being used in a way that will affect you. There's also instances where Google benignly took somebody's search history. They used it to give back advertising that they thought was relevant to them and they outed them at their workplace. Yeah. Right? So I'm just saying there are examples where information that starts free and usable and with benign and positive intent goes into places where either inadvertently or otherwise they're misused and you don't know what's being done with them. So is there a possibility where we have to say, okay, if Google is making use of all this free information, then we also have a right to know the algorithms or what they're doing with it in a way that allows things to be done in a way that isn't against the interests of the people that are sharing with them. And as the corollary of that, I want to know what your favorite Black Mirror episode is. <laughs> I haven't actually watched the series yet. So I, I can't answer the question. Um, although I, it's, it's on my list. It's on my list. Um, I, 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 okay, I lied. I saw the first episode with the pig. <laughs> That's, A lot of people stop right there. <laughs> well, my wife told me that I was going to have to watch the rest of the series by myself, that she wasn't going to watch it after that one. So, <laughs> no, I, I believe, let's put it this way. I, I started watching um, Altered Carbon. I had to watch that one by myself. So, I, you know, I had to steal times when she wasn't around to watch the rest of Altered Carbon. But I digress. In, in answer to your question, yeah, in the future that I'm painting, I want people to pressure by, partly by understanding how all this stuff works, to like I said, throw the doors wide open on information. The information shouldn't just live in Google, okay? And now as we get into the world of AI, as you probably already know, nobody actually knows how most of the... I mean, we have a basic understanding of how deep learning works. You know, the, the, you know, the, the bots teaching other bots and throwing away, you know, and eventually you get a copy that's really, really good at figuring out the difference between a bird and a plant, okay? But the fact is, nobody actually knows how it works. Okay. Um, no single human being actually knows the how it works. The, 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 the people who wrote them don't know. Either. They don't know either. Because at some point, what they've done is they've given the machine a set of instructions that says, come up with your own damn instructions. Okay. You need to solve the problem. I'm going to give you tools to solve the problem. And I don't care how you do it so long as you solve the problem. Okay. Quantum computing gets even weirder at that point. But although we have yet to see some really serious applications for that, but that's the point is the, the point is the information has to be like, now I'm going to use that old line, you know, information wants to be free. Information doesn't want to be free. Information is just information. Okay. But we as people in a world that's increasingly connected, that needs this information to build the future, need to pressure and build this, like pressure the people who have the information to make it as open as possible. And we need to come up with things. And the reason I use the Internet Archives a couple of slides back and so forth is we also need to build repositories for information that aren't just Google and so forth. And I don't know how we do all that other than the fact that we are technical people who understand the stuff 
to some degree, and because we're not, you know, the rich people sitting in an office somewhere, we have a reason for doing this stuff that other people might not have. Um, like, crazy side idea, okay? Why is it a, why do we have to go through internet service providers to connect? Okay? I mean, all of us have the means to create hotspots that would allow us to jump from one device to another. I know, privacy, I understand all that. But the fact is, we have the technology for, like, I mean, there are wireless routers in every house in the country, in most of the civilized world, okay? There are wireless routers everywhere. We could build an internet on top of, or underneath, however you want to look at it, the internet. Yes, I know there's the dark web, but I'm not talking about that. There, there's no reason not to have this completely open internet. The technology to build this thing exists today. And I haven't come up with a single person who can't come up with a technologically sound reason why we can't do this. And, um, and I think it's something that we should be doing as people who believe in open source and who... who yes? No, sorry, I didn't interrupt. Uh, no, no, not at all. Just because you're kind of like, so, so I, I, I've worked, my previous company was an open source software company, and we ran out of money. <laughs> so then, uh, so the new company I work for, we got acquired by, uh, they have a platform, which is, I'd say, like 90% of it is using uh, community upstream projects that we fork, we, we do our own work on it, and then we distribute a binary blob, essentially. But really, nothing's encrypted. So everyone can go through it on their own and open source it freely, theoretically. They'd be violating a licensing agreement right but so like everything you went through is is great i agree with it in college i was like that guy who was always going on about linux it should all be free freezing speeches and beer but i mean when you think about it i say the last five years though i'm just under 30 i'm i've seen well no i mean i'm just saying like you know when it, there's that saying and i'm sorry i don't mean to be inflammatory or political but they uh, someone once said this to me they, you know you're you're heartless if you're not a liberal in your early 20s and you're uh you're an idiot if you're not a conservative and you're late. Not not to say anything political, but because I've had this conversation with other people, like everything you're saying, like why can't we just do this? This makes so much sense. Always, there's people and regulations and process, but moving forward, we've already seen the disruption of all these industries as a result of technology and our ability to innovate. But how is that commercial relationship going to continue? Because do you think open source is like the snake on the turtle's back that's going to stab it when it gets to the other side of the the river? Or am I butchering that analogy? I'm not sure how it goes here, but like what you're saying. Um Honestly, I, I think that, you know, and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm still 15 in my brain or something like this, but um, I honestly think that the commercial models that you're talking about are, are dinosaurs. You know, they are, they are the closed source systems that have to die and will eventually die. I don't know how we can move forward in a world that maintains the same economic models that we've been building all this time. I don't think there's a way to do this. So the only way, um, the only way is to accept that this isn't working anymore. And, and not everybody's gonna accept it, and by definition, some of this is gonna be violent, and I'm not talking about fisticuffs of violent, but it's gonna be you know, violent intellectually for people to accept, but I don't see a future where we don't accept these things and move forward beyond old models that cannot just continue being recreated all the time. We're, we're, we're past it. You know, and, it, and if you stop to think about it for more than a few minutes, it's obvious it's not working. You know, it's obvious it's not going to continue working. Um, so everything open all the time. Imagine a world where everything is free, because that's where we're headed. And he's waving at me. <laughs> no, I don't want to ask a question. Oh. I'll follow up on that. Sure. So uh, the corporations that uh, benefit most of open source, like Google, Facebook, Amazon, they're not doing that good of a thing. So Amazon has this horrible thing with factory workers, Facebook basically subverting democracy everywhere, and they, they take the benefits I, yeah, of, of the open source. To do that, like it's, it's, it's yeah, but that's yeah. happening. Yes, of course. So, so like, yeah. what can we do about? Like, we have this oh, 
nice optimism about oh, uh, yeah. our society changing it will change like uh, science fiction like oh, it's, it's going to be like um, it's like a science fiction movie but what if it doesn't work out and what's going to happen like the, what's the worst case scenario well the worst case scenario is that we continue going down the same road that we're going trying to use the same old ideas all the time and it all falls apart flat in our faces um, again again I don't I don't see a way forward that solves a lot. I mean, we've got a hell of a like. This is a great time to be alive. Okay, I use the idea of my kid is living in a world of magic. He asks for something and it just miraculously happens. This is an awesome time to be alive. But there are also a lot of threats facing us: economic threats, uh, war threats, uh, bioengineered weapons threats. Um, 3D printed handgun threats. I mean, you could economic threats. I mean, when is the next big bubble going to burst, and how much money are we going to be willing to throw at companies? You know that we have deemed are too big to fail to save them. I mean, if you stop to think about how much money was thrown into these companies to let them continue operating, the very same companies that created the mess in the first place, you could have wiped out everybody's debt in North America. Everybody. Like, you know, <laughs> and yet we, we gave it to them. We gave them our money. So, so we are basically accepting, yeah, we're basically accepting that the old ideas that everybody is, and again, we've got, we got to stop believing this shit. Okay, we're accepting that these old ideas are the right ideas because why? Because we've always done it that way. So we have to come up with another way to always do it that way. Well, no, we don't want to always do it that way. We're at a time where things are moving so fast and development is happening so fast and people are connected in ways that they've never been connected before that we need a whole new set of ideas. And I think that whole new set of ideas is a world where everything is free. I have an idea. I have an idea. Um, so I, I disagree with the point that you had made, which is that everything will be free eventually. I think there will always be people making free. free oh, <laughs> oh as, in, as in speech or as in beer? Free as in speech, but uh, there will be an awful lot of it. I mean, we'll still be trading okay. things. Anyway, so I don't, yeah. I can't respond directly to that Sorry, point. go ahead. But since we have people making cool new things mm -hmm. all the time, those cool new things will always have scarcity. Mm -hmm. And if we tax um, the people who are profiting from them, whether it's a robot profiting or person profiting whoever it is in the social contract that's profiting we tax them yes. so that the rest of the social fabric can continue to operate and provide the basic needs probably a ba talking something like universal basic income probably a basic I, income. I, I agree with that hundred percent like absolutely 100 percent but as a step to move us forward it's not the end game Okay, it's how we keep things going until we figure things out. But money has this inherent uh, emergent property that no one is in charge of setting the the, the price, and so um, by having a market and money system, you you actually benefit greatly by the efficiency of that emergent property. Until we until we stop coming up with ways for everybody to be able to make money to keep the system operational, which is where we get back. But to we will taxing. always have we will always have cool new things. Yes. Yeah. And we will always have to buy them because of scarcity. Have to, allow to have to allow things to die? Yeah, in 2008, we didn't allow like three quarters of the banks of the world to die. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's actually. It was probably, honest, honestly, it was probably a good thing, but it pisses me off that it happened at all. <laughs> um, you know. The other half of that point. Yeah. Yes, please. I'm, I'm one of the lead organizers of a new organization in Toronto called the Basic Income Toronto Advocacy Network. And um, anyone who's interested should ask me about it. Um, Excellent. Yes. Bravo. All right, I'll stop talking now. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it.